need to do. Paul began by saying that uh, he is the least to be considered as an apostle. But even in that kind of his apostleship, he has one thing in common to echo. As he said, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called apostle because I persecuted the church of God. What does it mean? You remember when Paul took up uh, authority and he went out to persecute the church of Christ. And so much so that when he came back to the Lord, he had some indebt indebtedness unto God. And for the very sake of the people he persecuted, he did everything in his power that it will be. Do you know that uh, Paul will always say that I worked more than anybody else? That should be. Because he said that I persecuted those that should have lived to make the gospel multiply. He had the conscience that I killed many. And therefore, their job, I have to take it upon myself and do more, more than anybody. To the extent you remember when he goes to every place and he preached, he would compel the people to hand over their silver collection, the offering, so that he would be able to go and give to the saints in Jerusalem. He, he, he impoverished them. He made the Christians to become poor because at that point of persecution, they scattered and they, the Christians became poor because they began very well, but Paul was persecuting them. And that is why Paul felt that he had also contributed in the Christians' persecution so much that he has impoverished them. And so wherever he go, he preaches his message. He must make sure that there is an offering that he will go back and give to the saints in Jerusalem. So Paul called himself the, the least of the, the apostles, and he says that, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and uh, his grace to me was not uh, in vain. So that means that the grace that was given unto him, it was a grace that can propel him, that he will work relentlessly, and he will never break down. You see, when the grace of God is given unto you, you never get tired in what you are doing. That's the number one thing that you will trace. You will never get tired. You see, the grace goes beyond the human strength. So sometimes I've had even pastors, I've had men of God, people and they say that what inspires you and what makes you do what you do because you are always on the go 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 you see the grace that has been given unto me i am so thankful unto it the grace beats about every sickness and every disease that will shut me down from performing and therefore it's not that i am better off than anybody but it's the grace that has been given to me so that i will have a penetration because if god gives me the strength every morning i have to give it back unto him and therefore god it will be almost like unheard of for god to deny me of that blessing so that i might be very quiet when he needed his message uh, to uh, to go forth so it is the grace of God that makes me what I do. 365 days, you will be on the line, and God will carry me through every day. And that is the bane. That's the, 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 uh, the destroyer. God destroys everything around and gives me the chance of grace. So I have seen that even by my natural aspect of it, I would have broken down and I wouldn't have done anything. So anybody who has the, the gift and have the grace of God upon your life, there is no limitation. Everything that you do, you don't look over your shoulder. Whether somebody is there to help you or assist you or nothing, you begin and you are burned in that love. That's why sometimes I treat people who come on the line almost like uh, uh, my students. Why? It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter where your background. I want you to have that love, the zeal and the passion for it. And therefore, I begin to even groan in my spirit that are these people... Uh, uh, ready to take in the fullness of God. I begin to challenge myself and push so hard that if I'm on the line, I say, I can hear your voice. I want you to read. Like this morning, only a few people read. You know, I would have just charged it and begin. By the grace of God, I have to just uh, restrain it. Because the love that is built in me, if you are just playing any kind of thing. I don't, I don't uh, succumb to nonsense. I want you to just get into action and become the one that God has uh, deemed you to be. And that's the grace. And it makes you 
almost like uh, impossible to be attained. And now Paul comes in and talk about the resurrection because some people are saying that they don't believe in resurrection. And you say you don't believe in resurrection and then you say that you have been baptized into Christ, then your baptism is not. I'm not talking about water baptism, but Paul is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism that places us and puts us into the family of God. That's the baptism Paul is talking about. The moment you walk into to become a child of God, God baptizes you. Because of that baptism, you have his identification. And the identification in you is a spirit. Those that are led by the Spirit are the children of God. You become a child of God and be placed into that kingdom. The transfer or the changing of hand, changing of the old hand guard into the new guard is called the baptism. Baptism is nothing uh, than being taken into a new group of uh, believers called the kingdom-minded people. So Paul was now enlightening them and telling them the importance of uh, of the of the gospel so that we might be able to talk about the resurrection and then the power and paul says that if the message of our message only ends by the dead of christ it is uh, uh it is immature you have to get into the resurrection the verse 14 and if christ has not been raised our preaching is useless our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So it connects the resurrection with our faith, and therefore we are established fully when we know that Jesus uh, was raised for us because he was uh, punished for our justification. You know, yeah, our offenses was laid on him just because that he was to die on the cross. But my justification that I will put on the righteous garment was just because he raised uh, from the dead. Then he went on and said, more than that, we have we then found so uh, to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So Paul is now saying that, let me tell you, I become a false witness, and those that came before me also become false witnesses, if we don't believe that Christ was what was raised from the dead, and therefore uh, we have to guarantee that it is the raising of Christ from the dead that makes our message to be sound. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not uh, uh, the, the dead are not raised. So here Paul is talking about the ifs. There are so many ifs in this chapter. And Paul took up every if and uh, disciplined that if. And so he comes back to 16. He said, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised uh, either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Wow. So Paul is saying that the equation of our sin being forgiven and being justified based upon the resurrection nature, we have no option than to believe it and trust it. And he says that there are infallible proofs, four proofs that tells you that Jesus was raised from the dead. So there is nothing that you will become a, 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 a heresy where you talk about that Jesus was not raised from the dead. That's a far away doctrine. You don't, you don't belong to it. So once you believe that Jesus was raised and you believe in resurrection, then it is. But it's not about this resurrection that he's talking about it. Right now he does not experience, no man has experienced it except Christ. And the last day when he comes, we will experience the, the body will go through that transformation of that resurrection. Then those who have uh, fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That means that if right now, those who died in, and then we even had the chance of uh, eulogizing them, bringing them before the church, praying and then taking them to the cemetery and then burying them. Their hopes is gone and nobody has ever hoped. 19. If only for this life we are full in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Paul is saying, we are to be pitied. That means that if there had not been resurrection, there's no hope. There's no hope. And because there is resurrection, you and I have hope. But Christ had indeed been raised from the dead. <laughs> so when he is able to settle all the if, he comes to the verse 20. Thank God. But Christ has 
indeed been raised from the dead. I don't think that any of us have a dispute about the dead and the resurrection. These people were too much that Paul have to spend a lot of energy in talking about this thing. And but for for us, it is good for us to be able to also echo it because those that we are going to meet and invite them into the kingdom, we are inviting them based upon the scripture. Yesterday I talked about so many friends that I invited that some even died and knew so many of them have died and knew that they were having no hope because they went back and they did go into Hare Krishna, some became Buddhist and we all grew up in the same uh, place. But you invite them to come into the church, see our youth services, see whatever it is apart from talking about the death barrier of Jesus. And so it, they had no foundation and they went back. But that was their destruction and many of them could not uh, come back again. So verse 20 says, uh, the last enemy to be destroyed will be uh, death. Christ will do everything necessary to hold everything in check. That anything that will not rise to that kind of uh, uh, dignity, uh, Christ will put it down. He's saying that as the first man died, we all became dead uh, zombies. But then as one man was raised from the dead, we all also have an expectation of a raising. The bodily resurrection is coming. And therefore, we must not spiritualize it and talk about it as if uh, it is uh, something different. You see, when you look at the, uh, the last verse over there in the verse number 44, it said, it is sown a natural body, it is raised spiritual body. Most of us, we stand upon the last, uh, the spiritual body, and we spiritualize everything. What he's saying is that when you live in this world, this earthly passion, where we call it our universe, God made this body for this universe. And therefore, there is another body that we are going to inherit because we are not going to be on this earth again. We are going to be in a new place, but it will also be called the new earth. When we go into the new earth for that millennium, when Christ comes for his church, and then he takes us back into the gathering of the saints, which is going to be in the last day. You remember that when we studied the book of Revelation, we talked about that how Christ will come. He will take the church home seven years. Seven years, he will take us and we will not see him. He will prepare us for seven years. And after seven years, he will come back and he will lead us into the millennium reign. And he will take us into the new earth that the Bible says that uh, John said, I saw it coming like a parcel from heaven. And that new earth is going to be called uh, the new Jerusalem. And the new earth is going to be called the new Jerusalem. This old earth will still be in existence. And thousand years when we have gone to spend that eternity, Christ Jesus will come and fold this earth that you and I bragged about and build every edifice with our money and substances that we labored for will be folded up and will be destroyed. And that is the reign. And therefore, there will not be any Satan, there will not be any illness, there will not be any kind of thing in the millennium reign. And after we have spent a thousand years there, God is going to take the church, you and I, we will go into heaven and we will be there because it's not even the old heaven. There's going to be a new heaven. And you and I will dwell in the new heaven. And then he will leave the new earth to the Israelites to live in the new earth. We remember the 144,000, those of you who can remember. The 144,000 will be on the new earth together with those during the tribulation that were also saved. Those who become the uh, tribulation saints will also join the 144,000 and they will dwell on this earth for pro uh, procreation. They will multiply and continue in their life. But you and I, 
will become like the angels above. We will be there with him in eternity. And those every, every month, one of the tribes on earth, the new earth, will come into heaven and they will uh, bring up their splendor and they will share their joy and they will worship God for a whole month only to return to earth for the next group also to come. Twelve, twelve months in a year, twelve, uh, 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 twelve tribes, they will be coming from different gates, from different gates of the heaven and every tribe will go through his own gate and they will come and give God their splendor and they will worship God and that day I will see uh, uh, Minister Eneka I will see uh, Dr. Uju and I will see Dr. Jude and I will see uh, Pastor Samuel we, we will be in that glory and we will see David and others coming in and giving God the best and the worship because after that they have to go back to earth. They belong to Israel and they are within the 144,000 that God is going to shape. These are the men that will remain on earth. But it's not this earth, but the new earth. Unless you come into study to know all these things. If you have been on study, I wouldn't even take time to talk about this because we have studied it in Revelation. So these are some of the things that Paul was yearning that people will know that when we get up in that new body, it is not going to be spiritual that will be like air or smoke. We will be the same body, but this one is a glorified one. We will have a glorified body and we will live in that glory because we're going into a new kingdom and a new rule and Christ will be there. You remember the Bible says that after Christ has done all that he has to do, he will hand over the kingdom unto his father and then he will go back to the Trinity, join in the Trinity and the father will work everything until he puts everything under the, the reign and the domain of Christ. And the Father will appoint Christ to make him to become the one who will sit on the throne forever and ever. That's how the glory is. And so Paul is uh, explaining it in this very chapter. And so now we have some hope that we will not eat and die like some people say, let's eat, let's drink and die. For tomorrow, oh, we, we are dead. No, Paul is saying that life, there is life after death, and that life will come. And when it comes, you will have a new body. So don't ever believe in the heresy where people believe that when we die, uh, the, uh, when we eat, we die, and uh, we eat, we drink, we will die and forget it. A lot of people have that theory. Oh, when we die, that's it. And those who think that they want to be spiritual, they say when you die, you will come back being born as a crocodile, or you will be as a roach. I don't want to die and come back to become a roach, to be eating only uh, cloth and, and uh, books. No, like the Buddhists talk about. You don't know how many years you have to. If you become good, you go back and come back and become a, like an animal. My goodness, the Bible describes it. There is a body for human being. There is a body for animals. There is body for uh, uh, birds, and there is body also for uh, for what? Uh, for fish. So I cannot change from body into becoming a fish. Never. That's what the Bible is saying. So let us start up for this truth. And when this truth is in you, you are glorified. May God help us, and may God assist us that we will continue to dwell in this very space through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.